I'm going to give you a rundown of our, our new astrograph that we just introduced uh, earlier this year at, uh, at NEF. Uh, so it's a brand new uh, optical design. So this is the Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. It's kind of a mouthful, so we've actually kind of given it the appropriate acronym RASA for short, R-A-S-A, the Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. So this is a dedicated astrograph. It can only be used with a camera, cannot be used with an eyepiece. As you see in these pictures, and we'll have this telescope on display throughout the rest of the day so you can get a closer look, the camera is fixed to the front of the telescope in front of the corrector. And now the first inclination is, of course, to kind of associate this with fast star and hyperstar. And I think it's important to just kind of point out some of the key differences um, why this is really a unique telescope that actually the more you look into this telescope, the more you realize it's nothing like um, fast star and hyperstar, except for the fact that, of course, you're putting the camera in front of the corrector. And, of course, that this is a native uh, astrograph at f2.2. It's not an add-on uh, assembly or, you know, it's not, it's not a lens that you can exchange. There is no secondary mirror. And, again, you cannot use it with an eyepiece. It's only with a camera. Uh, you know, at the first glance, it's uh, much physically longer than our standard 11-inch schmidt cassegrain and our 11-inch Edge HD. This is also an 11-inch scope. The primary mirror, which is spherical, is a little bit longer. It's affected the physical length of the tube. And there's a four-element group at the front of the telescope that actually rests behind the corrector. It's actually adding a little bit to the length of the telescope because the secondary mirror is usually placed in front of the point of focus. So these lenses are placed closer to the point of focus, so the whole scope is a bit longer. So why the Roe Ackerman Schmidt? And we did want to give appropriate credit to the optical engineers that conceptualized and designed this telescope. Uh, David Rowe, as many of you know, actually uh, works very closely with both Celestron and Plane Wave and was key in creating the corrected Dahl Kirkham design, the CDK. And Mark Ackerman is a very high-level optical engineer stationed out at University of New Mexico. Does some incredible work as well. And he actually implemented a rather elegant design here with the exception of the corrector lens, which is a standard Schmidt corrector. All surfaces are spherical. So that four lens element group at the front, all the radiuses are spherical. It's a bit more elegant. And the manufacturability of that is an advantage. So you know you can produce a very high-level system. And of course, as I mentioned, the primary mirror is also spherical. For those of you who have imaged with Hyperstar, because again, it's the inclination. You know how fast and forgiving things are at around f2, or in this case, f2.2. And this is really kind of what brings this instrument to shine, is the really fast optics and the short focal length that provides a wide field of view. And in astro imaging today, that's really all the rage. Uh, that's wide field imaging. And you can do so many things with your composition uh, as opposed to high resolution imaging, which is very rewarding in itself, but also comes with additional challenges with tracking and seeing conditions and typically need a, a mount that you know, tracks more precisely. Auto guiding is a must, whereas auto guiding with this focal length of 620 millimeters is often optional. You have to start thinking about exposures in seconds rather than minutes. So I'm thinking, okay, 30 seconds is actually what used to be 10 minutes if I was imaging like with a, you know, Edge HD at F10. Kind of wrap my head around that. Like, okay, I'm taking 60 seconds. I'm not taking 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Uh, that changes things quite a bit. And aesthetically, wide field astrophotography, you know, is very pleasing. And there's so many things you can do, mosaics and just getting large swatches of the sky. It's amazing. And we're seeing example image after example image now. John Davis is a uh, actually been using one of these telescopes in his observatory in Texas and has been churning out some images and most recently his propeller nebula shot is actually in a full page uh, in the reader gallery of Sky and Telescope. And uh, that is uh, just showing already that the telescope and some of its astrophotos are getting um, published. So with this being 620 millimeters long at f2.2, uh, you're able to obtain really good astrophotos, and I dare say it is easier in many ways because, as I mentioned, you're not going to uh, run into the challenges as you do with long focal length high resolution astro imaging that is so demanding of the tracking and the conditions, which sometimes you have no control over.
quickly, I'll just give you kind of a rundown on some of the features here of the telescope. We know about the optics and how fast it is. One of the things that really makes it unique as well is the uh, image circle, 70 millimeters. So it's very large. And that's 70 millimeters. That's going to exceed the size of, uh, obviously, a full-frame camera. But it also means that if you are using something like a full-frame camera, that would include Canon 5D series. Or ignoring the form factor of the camera for a moment, that means you could use a 16803 52 millimeter square. It's a huge chip that would actually work with the image circle size. It's well within the capability of the telescope. And this is where you can really start to take advantage of a large field of view. And it's very much optimized across that 70 millimeter circle. I'll show you radius of the spots, pinpoint of light from center to off axis. It almost does not degrade at all. You could essentially focus on a star in the far corner of the sensor. Not that you would, but just for example, you, there's really no discernible drop off in performance from center to edge as far as uh, the optical capability of the telescope. Form factor wise, because we are fixing the camera in front of the telescope, the camera can't be that large. But it's right at home with a DSLR. And the fact that the DSLR obstructs a little bit of the corrector, actually we've found even when we've taken our images and done some testing, that it really does not detract from the image. You are missing that small percentage of area. But the bizarre shape of these DSLRs, they're not just rectangles. They actually kind of disperse the diffractions. On bright stars, you typically don't end up with these unwanted flares or diffraction artifacts. It may not be true for all cameras, but it was an initial concern of mine. Okay. I mentioned the four element lens group at the front. There's a couple things we've done to the telescope mechanically. We actually have been improvements over our standard SETs and Edge HDs. One is actually the focuser. Like the SET and Edge HD, the primary mirror does move forward and back to achieve focus. And as many of you know, that means it's not immune to image shift, but we've done a couple things to address that. Now, because there is no light going through a baffle tube in the back of the telescope, we now have basically like a solid steel shaft and uh, a brass bearing that rides that that has better tolerance than it would if it was just a primary baffle tube. So you get less image shift. In addition to that, the shorter focal length isn't going to exaggerate the image shift as much. And in addition to that, we've just included a feather touch micro 10 to 1 focuser, essentially the standard for a lot of the fine focusing. And that's ready to couple to any popular motorized focusers, including the micro touch that Starzona offers. So having the improved focus mechanism, you have a better tolerance bearing in the back, less image shift. You have the better feather touch micro. It's easily adaptable to your favorite motorized focuser. And in the back of the telescope here, you still have the mirror locking clutches as we've implemented on the Edge HD. So once you have reached focus, you can essentially anchor down the primary mirror. So any shift that might occur after that point, or mirror flop if you would want to call it, wouldn't occur. It would just be anchored down. Between that and the tighter tolerances, you're going to have a system that provides just better rigidity of the primary mirror. Also on the mechanics, air cooling system. We don't have optics in the back of this telescope. We're not putting an eyepiece back here. There's no visual back. So we might as well make use of that space, right? So we put a nice little maglev fan. We've improved the airflow. The mesh that we use actually allows more air to pass through just a 12 volt fan that's going to assist in the cool down time of this 11 inch telescope. That's built in and included. That does help you out there. We include a couple of the camera adapters that you're going to probably use initially, especially for DSLRs, ready to fit to your T-ring. There's a 42 and a 48 millimeter camera adapter. Of course, the image circle is much larger than that, and I foresee there being custom-made adapters that better utilize the larger image circle area. In fact, when I was using this at uh, Texas Star Party last month, we made a custom adapter that fit the QHY11 to better illuminate that full-frame sensor, and uh, it, was, it was a very nice combination. Let me talk about the illumination. This is just showing relative illumination. So on axis, we say relative illumination, 100%. If we go a little over 21 and a half millimeters off axis, we're still at nearly 80% illumination. That's easily going to be taken care of with flat field calibration. And that again is full frame APS format. It's gonna be even more forgiving than that. You can of course extend it larger. You get more drop off, but as you know, many telescopes don't illuminate 100% on the edge. In fact, far from it and with uh, taking flat field calibration that uh, corrects your astrophoto. So it's actually uh, at around 78% at the edge of a full frame. It's actually very good. That's uh, without having to you know, go with an even larger obstruction. And now check out the spot size, the radius here. This is ridiculous. So 1.8 microns. Now what happens when we go out to a full frame, 21.6 millimeters off axis? What, it's maybe degraded to two microns? So 
you can think of these spot sizes being very small, which they are, which means you can use a sensor with very small pixels and the telescope will realize the full resolution of the camera. So this is just incredibly optimized. It's a flat field, coma free. I mean, to the point where there's really no change as you move off axis, so it's an incredible design. And a couple of eye candy photos to show you here. This was full frame, uncropped. QHY11, no flat field calibration actually in this case. The Sagittarius Trio, this was a lot of fun. This was just out at the Texas Star Party. Now the Kodak 11,000 uses large pixels, which you can make the argument, well, that's undersampling. You're not really utilizing the, the resolution of the telescope, but just out of practical usage, we found that it's still a very nice pairing because you're using that large chip, taking advantage of the Roe Ackerman Schmidt's large uh, image circle. So um, full frame, full frame is right at home and Canon 5D Mark III, anything like that would work really well. M33 actually taken with our Nightscape 8300 one-shot color. Again, this telescope's actually really good with one-shot color and it's kind of don't have to worry about doing LRGB when you're imaging at such a fast focal length. But that being said, I'll skip actually here real quick. Uh, QSI 583 with a filter wheel. Yes, it will fit. Yes, it will reach focus. In fact, you have room to spare. Come upstairs and talk to us about back focus. Uh, you have actually around 70 millimeters to work with total, whatever your imaging combination might be. Uh, here's the row of Fiucus region. Again, full frame, uncropped. This is a two panel mosaic. It could have been easily a six panel mosaic to get the red and surrounding areas. Mosaics were really easy with this telescope with flat field calibration. Uh, I believe this is the shot that's in the Sky and Telescope Reader Gallery from John Davis. This was captured in his observatory in Texas. Again, filter wheel LRGB is absolutely fine with this telescope. Some one-shot color, Markarian's chain, doesn't really show a lot of the detail here in this projection, but this is actually a cropped image. These were 90-second sub-exposures, and we were picking up magnitude 17 and 18 galaxies in 90-second sub-exposures, so that was quite a bit of fun. Certainly there's a lot more to talk about if anyone has interest uh, and wants to see this upstairs and uh, feel free to ask Eric or myself and uh, thank you very much for your time.